with uh, my dear friend, Dr. Mohamed Sobh and Dr. Hassan Khidr. And I, I'd like to thank especially uh, Professor uh, Tar El Baz, the chairman of the society, and Dr. Hassan Shaheen and Dr. Omar uh, Hassan for this uh, elegant uh, Congress, and I hope it will uh, finish with great success. And also, I'd like to uh, introduce my dear colleague, Professor Simon Davis, Professor of uh, Nephrology and Dialysis in uh, North uh, Sta uh, Staffordshire and in, uh, Keen, in, in Keel University. I know him several years ago. He is interested in uh, peritoneal dialysis, experimental and clinical. And he was the past president of International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. And he is a member of the UK Renal Registry Dialysis Group and also a chair of the International Society and research committee and associate editor of Peritoneal Dialysis uh, uh, International. He will give a lecture on today on uh, volume control. Is it more difficult in BD than HD? Professor Simon. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, and for the, I'd like to also thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to uh, be here today. I had a wonderful holiday in Egypt about two years ago, and it's great to be back uh, uh, with you today. So I've been asked to address the problem of volume control and whether or not this is more difficult to achieve in peritoneal dialysis patients compared to hemodialysis patients. Now, the short answer to my question is not necessarily, but it's different. There are perhaps different problems, or different challenges in achieving good volume status in PD compared to hemodiasis. And to go about answering that question in more detail, I've divided my talk into three parts. First of all, I want to say a little bit about volume status in general as a predictor of outcomes in both hemodiasis and peritoneal dialysis patients if you like, looking at the similarities between those in terms of outcome. The second part of my talk, I want to focus more on the differences between the modalities in terms of how we can either control or determine uh, uh, volume status. And there are some important differences, I believe, between the two modalities. And then for the last part of the talk, I want to focus more on how should we be approaching the problem of volume control uh, and I'm actually going to show you some new data which we uh, haven't yet published from a randomized controlled trial which we've been conducting, uh, trying to understand the best way in which one might use bioimpedance as a tool for, uh, uh, if you like, guiding the clinician in terms of the best way to manage volume status in PD patients. So first of all, let's talk about the whole issue of volume status as a predictor of outcomes in hemodialysis and PD patients. So I think the goal of perfect dialysis therapy, really, is to try and normalize the extracellular fluid volume. What we're trying to do is to effectively get the, the optimal extracellular fluid volume at, at as much of the time as possible in uh, our dialysis patients. And the reasons we want to do that relate to the concerns around pressure stress, uh, tissue edema, and there's also some suggestion that when you get in a situation of prolonged sodium excess, uh, that also has uh, some detrimental effects, pleiotropic effects affecting, for example, the vasculature. One of the things I want to really say right from the start is that when we're talking about achieving the best extracellular fluid status in our patients, it's not simply a matter of salt and water in and salt and water out. There are other factors about our patients which determine their volume status. For example, their comorbidity, 
uh, and hypoalbuminemia, which I'll come back to in, in due course. But it is important to understand that there are several aspects of to, to, to poor volume control. We're, of course, all familiar with the pressure effects long term with the heart, with cardiac dilatation, the development of cardiac failure. Um, but of course, tissue edema as well is an important problem. And I've just given two or three examples here. Obviously, there's pulmonary edema, which is a concern, but you might also have gut edema associated with tissue uh, fluid excess. And we know that gut edema results in less good bowel function. And another area which is of concern is laryngeal edema, which we know uh, in dialysis patients exacerbates some of the problems associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So there are therefore more than one thing that we're trying to put right here. So what is the evidence that variation in extracellular fluid volume or achieved extracellular fluid volume in different patients is associated with different outcomes in the clinic? The important point I really want to make here is that all this evidence to date, anyhow, is either observational from observational studies or actually is indirect or inferred uh, in terms of uh, what we believe is the mechanistic effect. There are no good randomized controlled trials out there showing that if you contain a different fluid status in a different group of patients, that results in a better outcome. That is yet uh, to happen. And the sort of evidence we have is, of course, blood pressure. So high blood pressure potentially is a problem, but that's a complex picture, as I'll show you. Bioimpedance data. Bioimpedance can be used to assess the fluid status of individuals. It's good at particularly picking up evidence of tissue fluid. Um, and it also picks up the other problem which these patients get, which is muscle wasting. We have indirect evidence, which I'll talk to you in a minute, in terms of the fluid removal. Uh, uh, patterns in hemodialysis and PD patients, and I'll come back to that in the second part of my talk. And of course, we also know that other indirect markers of potentially fluid problems, such as cardiac markers, such as BNP, are uh, associated with worse outcomes. So what about the data around blood pressure control in PD patients? Well, the picture is complex. What we find is it depends on what the patient's problems are, uh, as to whether the blood pressure or how the blood pressure predicts subsequent outcomes. If you take, this is data from the UK Renal Registry, and you divide patients up according to whether they're on the transplant waiting list or whether they're not on the transplant waiting list, you see a completely different relationship between subsequent survival and the blood pressure. So transplant listed patients, to, uh, waiting list patients, high blood pressure is associated with increased mortality. but. Conversely, if you don't get onto the transplant waiting list, it's actually the opposite way around. The lower your blood pressure is, uh, the uh, worse your survival is uh, on dialysis. And that just in really underlines this whole issue that, of course, blood pressure is, not, uh, it, it is going to be determined by also the state of the cardiac function. So if you have poor cardiac function, you may have uh, low blood pressures. And similar data is observed in the hemodialysis population. There is some data on the intervention of, of managing blood pressure in hemodialysis populations. Uh, and I'm just showing you this meta-analysis published in The Lancet of trials looking at blood pressure control uh, and better outcomes in, in hemodialysis patients. It does seem from this study that better blood pressure control is associated with better outcomes. But here, of course, we're talking about interventions that are entirely related to medicines and they're nothing to do with control of the fluid status of the patients. So we still really don't know whether uh, controlling blood pressure using control of hydration status in the hemodialysis population results in better outcomes. This is a, a study done from Mexico where they looked at three different modalities of treatment, CAPD patients, APD patients, and hemodialysis patients. And what they looked at here was the relationship between fluid status at the start of dialysis and subsequent survival. And the message from this study really is that for all three modalities, the more tissue edema patients have in terms of their bioimpedance measurements, so the higher their extracellular water is for a given total body water, then the worse their survival. And that was independent of the dialysis modality. 
This is data from a complicated study by a group working with Fresenius using the body composition monitor. Um, and what they did in this study was look at the effect of overhydration in hemodialysis patients. Uh, this is that group here compared to uh, uh, group patients with good hydration status. So they compared them with a selected group of patients from the Tassin. Uh, dialysis center where um, those patients, if you remember, will have very long dialysis periods. So they have a very long, prolonged period on time on treatment, and they tend to have, as a result of that, better hydration status. And what they found was that the survival of the patients in the German unit, which had the same volume status as the hemodialysis patients at Tassin, had the same survival, whereas the patients who were overhydrated in the German unit had a much worse survival. And they wanted to show that that relationship did not seem to be a function 
that the uh, amount of water that they had was more, but that was because it was incorporated into muscle. On the other end of the spectrum, though, when we looked at patients who had more severe comorbidity, and actually only 50% of the patients in this category even survived that year, what we found was that they tended to lose weight, but the actual, their body water content increased with time on treatment. And as a result, therefore, you find that the percentage of body water has increased dramatically in this group of patients. These are patients who are muscle wasted, but have become relatively overhydrated over the 12 month period. So it certainly is very clear that managing fluid status in the hemodialysis population is greatly affected by the amount of uh, associated comorbidity. And what's really happening in those patients is they're tending to lose lean body mass with time on treatment. What about the process of dialysis itself? How does that uh, uh, affect the patients? Well, there's again increasing evidence that, uh, first of all, the more fluid you have to remove from a patient during a dialysis session, the more detrimental that is, uh, and also that the rate of that ultrafiltration is more, is more, is more associated with, with worse outcome. So here we see two different studies, one looking at the increased mortality risk associated with the increased interdialytic weight gain. This is corrected for nutritional status, so we've got rid of that aspect of, 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 the, uh, of the effect. Uh, and what you see here on the right-hand side is the patients who were subjected to higher ultrafiltration rates during hemodialysis, those patients had worse outcomes. And again, something similar was observed in the NECASAD study, which uh, uh, demonstrated, uh, uh, first of all, that residual renal function was more important, um, that they also found an inter uh, this relationship between interdialytic weight gain and mortality. And in this particular study, um, in addition to the fact that the residual renal function was important, um, they also found that in patients uh, who were um, getting an excess ultrafiltration compared to that interlatic weight gain, those patients had an increased mortality. And there are a number of possible explanations for that, and some of you may be aware of the work that Chris McIntyre, who's working in the UK, has been doing on this, uh, looking at the effect of high ultrafiltration rates on cardiac stunning during the course of a dialysis treatment. He measures uh, cardiac wall mo mobility uh, and associated that with a high ultrafiltration rate. So you actually get temporary cardiac dysfunction during high ultrafiltration rates, which in itself is a highly and very strong predictor uh, of survival over the next subsequent uh, year or year and a half. So certainly in hemodialysis, the problem seems to be that if we have to remove a lot of fluid and high rates of ultrafiltration, that is worse associated with a worse outcome. Whereas if you look at the PD population, it seems to be the other way around. So this is data from uh, the ADEMEX study. It's a secondary analysis of the predictors of survival in PD patients. And what we see, and this is a whole series of different predictors, but uh, um, when you look at the achieved ultrafiltration rates uh, as an independent predictor, what you find is that patients who have low ultrafiltration volumes, less than 400 mils a day in this particular study, um, but we've also observed it in other studies, that those patients have less good survival. So in PD, it seems to be more about a problem about getting the fluid out of the patient than it is about the detrimental effects of removing the fluid. So we did a similar study in the PD population looking at the uh, determinants of overhydration in PD patients. So this is the same type of technique that we use for the hemodialysis patients I just showed you. Again, I'm comparing predicted total body water from bioimpedance with actual measured total body water using deuterium dilution. And again, as you see, the majority of patients are above the line. So more patients are overhydrated compared to underhydrated. But actually, compared to the hemodialysis population, it's about the same. Perhaps there's a bit more variability in the PD patients compared to the hemodialysis patients. And when we looked at the predictor of that overhydration, we found that the single most important thing on multivariate analysis was how low their plasma albumin was. So we hypothesized that what was happening here was that uh, our patients had low plasma oncotic pressure. That was resulting in increased tissue edema. And if that was the case, then it should be possible to show that this overhydration, which has been reported in hemodialysis patients, 
and previously been linked to the uh, uh, low albumin level that some of these patients have, it should be possible to show that the extra, this water, this extra fluid, was in the extravascular compartment. And to do that, we measured the plasma volume in this cohort of patients using radio-labeled al albumin. And what we found was actually that the plasma volume in PD patients, on average, was exactly that as predicted in the normal population. There was more variance. This is the predicted versus the measured plasma albumin correlation. There was more variance you might expect to see, uh, but the actual average difference was the same. And when we looked at that compared to hypoalbuminemic patients compared to normal albuminemic patients, we found that, yes, the hypoalbuminemic patients were overhydrated, typically by three to four liters of extracellular fluid if their albumin was below 31. But when we looked at their plasma volume, this was not different in these two groups of individuals, really confirming our suspicion that the majority of this extra fluid or extra uh, hydration that you have in PD patients is sitting in the extravascular space. What about the membrane? I've already alluded to you that the, the poor ultrafiltration removal or fluid removal is a problem in, in PD patients. And essentially, you can talk about two types of membrane function which will result in less good ultrafiltration. You can talk about patients who have high solute transport. High transporters have less good ultrafiltration because they reabsorb the glucose more rapidly. When the glucose is absorbed rapidly, there's loss of the osmotic gradient. And also, there's actually more rapid reabsorption of fluid across these patients' membranes, which are effectively functionally larger than patients who have low transport status. But we now have solutions for that problem. We can treat them with APD. We can treat them with icodextrin. And using those two different tools, we can actually get rid of that excess mortality observed previously with high solid transport. So this is a meta-analysis showing the high solid transport associated with the worst outcomes. But actually, if you look at APD patients treated with high transport, uh, you, um, sorry, high transport patients treated with APD, they actually get better outcomes. So this is a solvable problem now that we have the techniques and understand that better. But there is a group of patients that you'll have uh, which have another problem, which is low osmotic conductance of the membrane, low efficiency of the membrane, and this is a different problem. It's when, for the same glucose gradient, for the same osmotic pressure, you get less efficient ultrafiltration. And in those patients, once they become aneuric, if they're unable to get more than 750 mils of ultrafiltration per day, uh, then those patients have a less good survival. Finally, I just want to say a little bit about residual renal function. I've mentioned it already. But just to remind you, there's now a lot of evidence out there, both in hemodialysis and PD patients, that first, maintaining residual renal function is, gives you a survival advantage. And secondly, that there are factors associated now with, or known factors associated with more rapid loss of residual renal function. Um, in PD patients, that tends to be episodes of volume depletion uh, or, or, or dehydration. Uh, as shown in the NECASAD study, and in a, several randomized controlled trials now, including one I'll talk about tomorrow in my session, the BALANCE trial, you can see that actually patients who achieve higher levels of ultrafiltration are more likely to lose their residual renal function more quickly. So one of the issues here is getting that balance between preserving residual renal function on the one hand and yet getting adequate fluid control on the other hand. And I don't believe we yet have the right tools uh, to answer that question. So that really takes me neatly on to the very last part of my talk, which is what I want to do is to discuss with you how is it that we should approach volume control in the PD patients? What is it that we need to help us manage those patients to try and get that balance, if you like, between residual renal function and volume control better? And to uh, address that problem, we've been looking at bioimpedance as a potential tool for doing that. We know that bioimpedance is a fantastic predictor of survival. If you're overhydrated, uh, in, uh, in, in, if, you, if bioimpedance shows that you're overhydrated, then you will have less good survival on dialysis. We also know 
uh, that uh, uh, we can use biomimpedance to track changes in, bio, in, in, in extracellular water. The, the randomized control trials we did back in the uh, almost a decade ago now, using uh, icodextrin, for example, showed very clearly that we could use biomimpedance alongside other more sophisticated techniques to track fluid status in PD patients. We should remember, however, that biomimpedance isn't telling us everything. It doesn't tell us, for example, the difference between intra and extravascular volume status. It can't tell you where the fluid is, whether it's in the intravascular space or whether it's in the interstitium. And as I've already told you, low albumin associates with relative extracellular uh, water expansion in PD patients, but not in an excess of plasma volume. So the question really is how would we use bioimpedance in the clinic to help guide us uh, with uh, um, uh, our fluid management? And to do this, we've, uh, what we've done, or just completed, is a uh, randomized controlled trial. We're calling it the UK Shanghai study because it was done in three centers in the UK and one center uh, in, in Shanghai. And really the idea behind this study was to randomize patients to those who the, in whom the bioimpedance data was available to the clinician when they were making decisions about fluid management. Uh, and the control group, that data was collected but it was kept uh, away from the clinicians. So they could not see the results. Um, and what we've done is randomized in quite a large study, 309 patients uh, were randomized in this study, uh, and we actually used a technique in biomimpedance called vector analysis, or vector plotting, which is when you plot the height squared of the resistance over the height squared of the reactants to help you guide you with the fluid status uh, of the patient. The randomization was stratified by country, and also stratified by the level of residual renal function. So in patients who have less than 200 mils of, ultra, uh, of, of residual renal function, we believe the strategies for managing fluid status would be different in those patients compared to those who still have residual renal function. Uh, we've now completed the study, and we had sufficient power to do the, uh, the predefined analysis in three out of the four groups that we wanted to look at. In other words, we could look at it in the uh, UK patients who are not anuric and the Shanghai patients who are both not anuric and also anuric. Unfortunately, we could not uh, recruit enough patients in the UK in the anuric population. Um, and what we did was we looked at the uh, expected uh, to, uh, what we expected to see in these patients was that their fluid status would, in the control group, deteriorate over the time whereas in the active group, we expected to see our patients be kept much more stable. And that is not exactly what happened. So what I'm going to show you is two data slides from this study. One is the data slide from the, 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 the non-anuric patients in the UK. So if you look first of all at the uh, green bars, that's the control group in this group, you can see that essentially there were no statistical differences over 12 months in their fluid status. So patients with residual renal function in the UK have very stable fluid status over a 12 month period. Interestingly, the clinicians in this study chose to set a lower target weight in the active patient group. They looked at the biomimpedance data, combined that with the blood pressure data, and concluded that these patients should have a reduction in their target weight. And when they did that, uh, they indeed did achieve a reduction in the target weight. There was a reduction in the total body water, but interestingly, there was no change in their extracellular water. So although they intended to reduce the weight of these patients, this did not result in an improvement in their extracellular to total body water ratio. Uh, and that, why that happens, we're not entirely sure, but it does suggest that you can't necessarily shift the hydration status of patients, particularly, for example, if it's determined by other things such as comorbidity and hypoalbuminemia. The second data slide I'm going to show you is from the uh, anuric cohort in the Shanghai study. And this was different again. What we saw in this part of the study was much more, more what we predicted would happen. What we found was in the control patients that their body composition deteriorated during the course of the 12-month period. 
They actually lost total body water, but they gained extracellular water. In other words, they were muscle wasting, but their overhydration became worse during that time. And that was seen in the control group, whereas it was not seen in the active group. The active group enabled the clinicians to keep these patients within normal parameters. So we conclude so far from that study that fluid status was much more stable in non-annuatic patients than we expected. We can see that there were some bioimpedance impacts on practice, that the bioimpedance may help to maintain fluid status in annuatic patients. But where changes were observed, this was really due more to a reduction in total body water, and there was a muscle wasting rather than an increase in the extracellular water. Um, and finally, as you could see, uh, attempts to rectify fluid status uh, in the non anuric patients uh, was not uh, necessarily resulting in the desired effect. So well, let me conclude uh, my talk by saying, just, just, just giving you a little bit of summary of what I've been saying. First of all, I've been making some comparisons between HD and PD in terms of the challenge of managing their fluid status. And what you can see here uh, is that uh, hydration is, tends to be, uh, uh, overhydration is associated with worse outcomes in both modalities. Residual renal function is associated with better survival in both modalities. Hypotension is associated with reduction in residual renal function in hemodialysis, dehydration in residual renal function, although you could argue these are two aspects of the same thing. Again, in both of the types of treatment modality, comorbidity is associated with overhydration. In contrast, however, ultrafiltration, which is intermittent in the hemodialysis population, the higher the ultrafiltration rate, the less good the survival, whereas in PD, where the ultrafiltration is continuous, actually it's the lower ultrafiltration that's associated with worse survival. Um, Overhydration in, uh, 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 in the hemodialysis population is probably a combination of both intravascular and extravascular uh, excess, whereas in the PD patients, particularly when they're hyperalbuminemic, that's associated with more overhydration. So to answer the question I posed, achieving volume control in PD is not necessarily more problematic than hemodialysis, but there are some important differences. I think what we're learning, uh, and not surprisingly, is that when you've got well-preserved residual renal function and also an, a membrane that works well, then it's actually probably easier to maintain uh, hydration status in the PD population. There's clearly a problem with hyperalbuminemic anemia in PD patients, and uh, until we solve the problem with hyperalbuminemia in these populations, I don't think we're going to make a fundamental change to the excess tissue edema those patients have. Having said that, there is no evidence that the hyperalbuminemia in the PD population is associated with an increased risk of mortality when compared to hemodialysis populations. There's a nice study from Rajmur Ultra showing that actually, if anything, for a given low plasma albumin, the survival in the PD patients is slightly better. I would, however, have one big caveat, and that PD, of course, is a time-limited therapy. It's not a therapy that can go on for 20 years. Uh, it's a therapy which is good probably for, in my experience, five to seven, maybe eight years, depending on the membrane. But beyond that time, it's very unusual to continue to, to manage patients adequately with hydration. And I just want to finish by acknowledging the many people who've been supporting this research, in particular the uh, patient, the individuals involved in the fluid balance studies and in the uh, Shanghai UK bioimpedance study. Many thanks for attention. Thank you, Simon, for this elegant lecture. And we have time for a few questions. Yes, Dr. Magdi? Okay, so the first question is about BNP and what the role of that is in, in the management of these patients. 
again, uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's a very useful predictor. So, and, and it actually predicts more than the <coughs> fluid state is measured by bioimpedance alone. So if you add bioimpedance and BNP into the, into the predictive models, you get additional information. The big difficult question which you're asking is, does BNP itself guide the clinician in terms of fluid management? The answer is we don't know. There's, no, there's been no trial yet done which has said, given that extra piece of information, would I then do something different? Um, for me, I find it useful to interpret um, the, uh, or, or, or tell me if there's a cardiac problem, if you like, but I tend actually to use echocardiograms uh, more than I use BMPs in that situation. Uh, so you get a strong correlation with BMP and atrial enlargement on, on, on echocardiographic imaging in PD patients, and it, that is an inter also an independent prediction of, of survival. But I don't believe just because you've got a large atrium that means the patient's fluid loaded, because um, it's probably a structural damage that's happened to the heart over some period of time. The second part of your question was about the use of subjective global assessment. I suppose what I would say is that that's one of the many tools that we have to try and help us assess what's happening to our patients. And I think the real value in that approach relates to the, what I was trying to say about what happens with people longitudinally with time on treatment. What tends to happen with sick patients is they get progressive muscle wasting. So SGA is a useful way of picking that up clinically when you may not necessarily have noticed it happening. Because it, it is quite a good tool, I think, for picking up changes in muscle wasting. That should be telling you that you probably need to revise the patient's weight downwards. Uh, I also, for many years, have used mid-arm circumference um, uh, as another way of, of measuring uh, nutritional status longitudinally. Uh, I'd like to ask about, uh, in order to, increase, to correct hypoalbuminemia um, albuminemia in a BD patient, you have to give the patient a lot of proteins. And we know that in excess protein diet it will lead to decrease in residual renal function. And also, how about the use of diuretics? We know it is yes, there the uh, residual renal function. And is it effective also in hemodialysis patients as PD? I'm not aware of any, any trials looking at the use of diuretics in hemodialysis populations. It's definitely been done in PD population, and I certainly routinely use diuretics uh, uh, to help manage fluid status in the PD patient before I increase their glucose prescription. Yes. Um, so if I would much rather do that before exposing the membrane to more glucose and relying on that to remove extra, uh, extra salt and water. It, it only affects the salt and water uh, removal, not, not the overall kidney function. But I'm not aware of any randomized trials uh, in, uh, of diuretics in hemodialysis populations. Uh, indeed, I'm not really aware of, that, I mean, apart from the ultra-pure water story of using very, very pure dialysate, of any other particular tools associated with preserving residual function in hemodialysis patients. And about increasing protein diet? So in terms of the albumin story, I think um, uh, the answer is that, um, yes, you must make sure they're eating reasonably, but actually there's pretty little evidence that increasing nutritional intake changes the plasma albumin in, in, in PD patients. P albumin in PD patients is determined first and foremost by membrane losses, okay? So that's the single most important thing. So high transporters lose more albumin. Uh, the second most important thing is the inflammatory status. And actually, nutrition comes pretty third or fourth down the list, actually, after that. Uh, so if we're going to improve the albumin in, in PD patients, we've either got to find a way of re reducing protein leak from the membrane, um, and one clever way to do that would be to recycle the albumin in, in a portable type of PD system, or well, the alternative is we've got to somehow switch off that inflammatory process, which is, I think, probably a sort of uh, a desirable thing for both the hemo and PD patients. If we could switch off the inflammation associated with chronic kidney disease, I think we would be benefiting our patients. Another question? All right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Magdalene. 
So, yes, I think that's... Perhaps I can suggest that I'm going to talk about sodium removal uh, tomorrow in my talk. I'm actually going to talk about the use of low sodium dialysis fluids in, in PD, and that might perhaps answer your question better. But in principle, we would like to get more salt out as well as more water out. PD is a therapy which, because of the, of the biology of the membrane, means that as you increase ultrafiltration, you proportionally get more water than you get of sodium removed from the peritoneal membrane. So the more hypertonic glucose you use, actually the more you remove, relatively speaking, water compared to sodium. So there is an argument for, once as you start to titrate up the dose of glucose, that if you use a low sodium solution, you might get more salt out, and that would be helpful in managing the fluid status. But I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow in my talk. Thank you, Professor Simon, for this lecture. Professor Richard Johnson. Uh, Richard Johnson is a professor of medicine and chief of the division of renal disease and hypertension in University of Colorado, Denver, and an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Florida. In addition, uh, he is a board member uh, of the Gout and Uric Acid Education Society. Professor Johnson is an expert uh, on uric acid as it may uh, relate to hypertension, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. He also is an expert on the role of uh, sugar and fructose in gout and uric acid related diseases. Professor Johnson has received numerous honors in his career, including the American Society of Nephrology, American Heart Association Young Investigator Award, and membership in the American Society of Clinical Investigation. He has lectured in more than 30, hundred, uh, more than 30 countries and received uh, several distinguished lectureship. He has uh, been a member of numerous editorial board for publications such as Kidney International, Journal of American Society of Nephrology, American Journal of Kidney Disease, Hypertension, American Journal of Physiology, and American Journal of Nephrology. I think Dr. Uh, Tarek uh, has something to say, which is very interesting, I think. Uh, Dr. Well, Tarek. Uh, the story is that I came to know Rick in 1995. We were on a Nile cruise to Luxor. Uh, Professor Nahas had organized a workshop for fibrosis. It was very cold, and I found him swimming in the swimming pool the night and I was going to do this crazy thing so we liked each other from that time. Anyway, two years later we had uh, the Egyptian Society Congress headed by Professor Magdi Siliman uh, somewhere near the pyramids and we were sitting together and he told me, Tarek, I want to tell you a secret. I say, what? He say, I'm working on uric acid and its relation to hypertension and chronic kidney disease and if this is true, I'll be a famous man. <laughs> that was a very long time ago, you know? He did, he did find a relation, he, he did become a famous man. And today, not today, yesterday we were in the desert. He told me, Tarek, <laughs> I want to tell you a secret. I say, what? He say, I discovered a new disease in Nicaragua. And guess what? I think you may have it in Egypt. I said, that's very interesting. And then you're going to be more and more, <laughs> more and more famous, Rick. So maybe, maybe this, this, this disease Rick is talking about today instead of uric acid may be a real challenge to us nephrologists in Egypt since he has an impression that we may have it. I introduce you to Professor Richard Johnson. Thank you very much, Tarek. Uh, it's really a pleasure being here. I've been to the Egyptian Society of Nephrology maybe five times, and uh, it's always a pleasure. This is a beautiful country. Uh, it's a beautiful people. Tarek, uh, 
is an exaggerator, and I do not want to become famous, but I do want to tell you this story uh, about uh, a kidney disease that's developing, uh, that's epidemic in South, uh, Central America. And I do believe that it may be a major cause of kidney disease, and that it may be one of the causes of CKD of unknown etiology. And I think many of you, many of you have seen patients in which they don't have diabetes. They don't have any history of specific illnesses that, or glomerulonephritis or anything like that, but they show up with small kidneys and end up on dialysis. And today I'd like to present to you uh, some data that suggests that this, that many, many cases, and perhaps the majority of CKD of unknown etiology may be attributed to this pathway. The story I'm going to tell you begins in Nicaragua, where there were the, and, the, and the candidates who are at risk are these young men who are working out in the agricultural fields. Most of these people are working in sugarcane fields, and they're working under high, uh, under very high temperatures. My guess is that in this country, there are many workers also out in the fields, very hot climates, and I, I, we are now aware that this same condition is occurring in Bangladesh, is occurring in Sri Lanka, is occurring in other parts of the world. And I predict and suspect that it is a disease that you are actually seeing but may not actually recognize what its causes. So here's the problem. Nicaraguan sugarcane workers are developing kidney disease. And they work very, very hard uh, and very long days with very little rest out in the, on the fields. There are some areas in Nicaragua where the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is approaching 70%, the highest in the world. And the mortality rate has doubled in these areas in the last five years. In the last 10 years, nearly 46% of all male deaths in Chicagalpa, which is one of the regions in Nicaragua, is due to CKD of unknown etiology. And 70 to 75% of all male deaths in men aged 35 to 55 over the last year, 10 years, in these regions is due to CKD. CKD is so prevalent that the region is called the land of widows because so many of these men are dying. And the workers are screened by the companies for kidney function when they, when they start work each season and they are fired if their creatinine is 1.3 or higher. I'm going to uh, play a little video which uh, 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 just talks a little bit about this condition. Son los que están aquí, el 70 y el 80% de, de la mayoría de todos los cañeros en este lugar. Algunos tienen hasta de 28 años, de 30 jóvenes, ya uno de 25 años que todavía mueren por causa de la cristinina y no hay curación, no hay enfermedad, no, nadie ha puesto mano en ellos y se están falleciendo y no hay alguien que ponga la mano y están muriendo jóvenes por, esa, por ese trabajo ahí, esa, esa enfermedad. A los 13 años. Cuando yo comencé a trabajar, comencé a, a cortar caña en, en, en el Ingenio San Antonio, ¿verdad? La segunda zafra que yo la corté, ya al final casi ya del, 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 del año para terminar, yo me enfermé y me fui al hospital al Ingenio y me salió la creatinina, que me decían que tenía el calcio, el potasio. Él me dijo un miércoles, no voy a ir a trabajar como él se de ganas, 
yo le hice un pollito así en sustancia. Al siguiente día, mire, yo busqué un taxi para hacerle el ultrasonido. Ya le salieron pues que no tenía ya líquido en su riñón. Él me dice, como él así era, mire, enséñame el, el resultado. No, hombre, le digo yo, porque viene engrapado, le digo yo, para no enseñarse, no afligirlo, pues, mire. Enseñámelo, me dice, si ya no sé que mis riñones están consumidos. Me dice. Lo miró, fíjese el resultado. Me dice, llévame para la casa, me dice, voy a ir a morir allá donde que me miren mis hijos. Me dice. Falleció, él volaba sangre, fíjese. Y era una angustia, mire que él para allá, para acá, mire. Fíjese que no tenía pero ni 15 minutos cuando él había muerto. Y ya echando, mire, como que estaba reventado por dentro. Sí, no le gusta jugar pelota, se empate, se a la patada. Y yo trabajo ahí en el limpiando la caña, al riego y este y GPS y todo eso hace Y ahí el trabajo siempre es lo mismo. Y ahí de un largo tiempo ya siempre uno cae con la misma enfermedad. Y ahí mejor eso es que una plaga que está aquí siempre, que es lo que lo lleva a la tumba.